Uh, welcome to the Essex County Ornithological Club meeting and speaker series. I am Constance Lapete. I'm president of the ECOC. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I have this huge smile on my face because I had started to write an introduction for a bunch of bird watchers, and it's clear that Brian Pfeiffer has brought his own fan club. Uh, and we're actually speaking to a bunch of people who might be offended if I refer to insects as bird food, um, but that's what we think of them as, at least in my house. Um, Anyway, if you've joined us tonight, you will be hearing Brian Pfeiffer speak uh, in about 15 minutes after a brief ECOC meeting. Uh, he will be asking us to refocus our binoculars to look not at the birds, but at what my mother called bibbits, insects, bird foods. This is insects for birders uh, coming up in about 15 minutes. So some housekeeping tonight, we are again lucky to be supported by the technical wizard from the Peabody Essex Museum, Corey Dodge. Uh, if you are having any issues, uh, you can put them in the chat box. Um, if you can hear me and you're having issues and you can't get in the chat box, you can also email him uh, at Corey underscore Dodge at PEM.org and he'll put that in the, uh, thank you, put that in the chat box. Um, we want to hear from you tonight. Uh, there's a couple of points where I'm going to ask you if you have any announcements, uh, if you've seen any cool birds. I'm going to keep with the birds. You can tell Brian about the bugs uh, later on. Uh, at that point, if you do, you can unmute yourselves and uh, let us know what you've got to share. So some announcements. This is the last speaker series uh, for the ECOC for this season. Uh, I hope we provided you with some distractions during the slower birding season of the year, uh, but it's time to cut you all loose and go outside again. So we're on hiatus for the summer. Uh, we will be back in the fall again. We decided to go virtual again in the fall, uh, just in case. Um, and uh, so we'll see you probably in September, Janie, is that thereabouts? Yeah, for our first speaker series. But don't worry, we're going to keep you busy in the meantime. Uh, we do have some walks planned starting in May. Uh, Jared Kies will be leading, uh, I think, five or six different bird walks in the Gloucester area. Uh, there's more information on our website, but I can tell you the first is May 6th at Dykes Pasture and Goose Cove. Uh, there will also be walks in Magnolia Woods and walks in Dogtown. So check out the site. Jared will be doing registration for those walks and you can get his contact information off the ECOC website. There are also a couple of co-sponsored walks with the Brookline Bird Club. Uh, I think John Nelson is leading. Uh, there's more information on our website for those too. So plenty of walks and also the granddaddy of them all, uh, the 115th annual uh, Ipswich Canoe Trip and Bird Survey is this year it's scheduled for Saturday, May 22nd. Uh, this is my favorite event of the year. It's a lovely paddle. It's a great event and sometimes the birds are good too. Um, we unfortunately we've provided boats and equipment in the past. We've been able to um, put people in boats and share boats are not quite ready to do that this year. So unfortunately, um, you'll have to come with your own boat, paddle, PFD. Um, we'll be putting some more COVID related guidelines on the website soon. We may even be following up with an email, uh, but I hope that doesn't slow you down. Uh, Dave Brewster is leading that uh, trip and his contact oh, information is it. on the website. Uh, I hope oh, now, does anybody else have any announcements to share? Don't be shy, you can speak right up. I have seen a request here to ask people to, to mute um, if you don't have any announcements. Um, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to mute anyone who's got it open. <laughs> Well, it sounds like we don't have any more announcements. Um, so I would uh, like to hand it over to our treasurer if she'd like to give us a treasurer's report tonight. Looking around in the gallery, I know I saw her face. Yeah, I'm here. That's it's me. Hi, folks. Um, 
We've had a flock of new members since the last meeting. So if this is your first presentation, welcome. I'm pretty sure it won't be your last because um, our speaker series has been amazing and it will continue to be amazing. Um, if you want to renew your membership, I'm still here. Uh, my information is on the website and I will put it into chat when I get done speaking here. Um, again, it's $12 per person, $15 per household. New members and anyone else who would like a decal can get one for a dollar. The, um, the logo of the club is on the decal. You put it in your window, you wear it with pride. It's excellent. Um, other than that, I would say um, Thank you again for joining and uh, your feedback and your funding helps us put this program together. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Um, so yes, if you enjoy our speaker tonight, which it's, I'm sure you're going to, I personally cannot wait, um, you know, know that uh, your dollars help to, uh, to fund these stocks. Um, I would like to uh, ask you now, uh, who's seen some good Birds, share your sightings with us. Don't be shy. I know there's good birds out there. Okay. I, had a, I have a mockingbird that's come around my house the last few days. Excellent. Kind of cool. And my first red winged blackbird of the season. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Thank I'm, you. Have this big old turkey in my backyard up in the tree. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I had three red-shouldered hawks <gasps> oh. dis displaying and chasing each other here in Gloucester, up at Dykes Meadow. Oh, really? Yes, it was very exciting. Now, with that, Dykes Meadow, is that different than Dykes Pasture, or is that the same place? Same thing. Oh, well, we're going to have a walk there, so there you go. Oh, That's good. Yeah. I'm on the Our Little Kestrel. River in Waltham. Uh, Waltham, sorry, Gloucester, and we have uh, our first osprey came in, and also uh, a snowy egrets are back, and a great egret. Snowy, Ooh. wow, that's a snowy. Time. Wow, yep. it's coming, it's happening. <laughs> well, let's see, what have I seen lately? I was out of town most of the week, but had a Good day last last week at uh, the wet meadows spot on Scotland Road up in uh, Newberry. There was already a glossy ibis and a lesser yellow legs in with the ducks. It was uh, mm. kind of unusual. I I'm on Mohegan and we just had a ring neck duck in our meadow. That was pretty cool. Oh, yeah, and we've had um, a lot of a lot of um, kill deer right now. So that's the big yeah. thing right now. Constance, I've had uh, singing pine and palm warblers at uh, at the pines on uh, Parker River. Mary Margaret, you're always oh, on nice. The hey, um, I had palm warbler at Nahant yesterday at the stump dump, and uh, I had a great egret today at Shoe Pond in Beverly, and I had a pied billed grebe at the Cherry Hill Reservoir today in West Newbury. Thank nice, you. Shiloh. I'm going to chase Constance, all the birds Constance, I've, I've got an update on the black scoters uh, in Ipswich. There, there, were, uh, uh, there was a record number of them this winter, uh, about four to 5,000. Uh, that smashed all previous records. There, there were maybe 1,000 most ever seen. This year, there were about 5,000. I was down there, I think last Sunday and saw maybe 800, 700, something like that. The, the numbers were down, but there were still a lot of them and the commoniters were similarly down, but there were still probably close to a thousand of them. And this is off the north end of Crane Beach in the mouth of the Ipswich River. Jim, that's amazing. I was seeing huge numbers in Salisbury and God bless you to have the patience to count them. <laughs> well, I estimated them. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure you're right on. <laughs> Constant, um, I'm in Rhode Island, but um, close by in Seekonk, Massachusetts, 
the great blue herons have gone back to their nesting sites behind uh, Home uh, Depot. Uh, so now's the time to see them because there is no leaves on the trees and uh, those great big spindly legs um, up on the top branches, but they are starting to pair up and doing their mating rituals. Oh, that must be really neat to see. It is. Wow, thanks for sharing that. Any other sightings you guys wanna share? There's a whole bunch of sightings on the chat, Constance. I don't know if you were seeing any of those, but. Goodness, uh, let's see, we've got three inches of snow and two bluebirds in Glover, Vermont. Swans back in the pond off Jeffrey Avon, Salem, Golden Crown Kinglet and Marblehead Neck. Uh, let's see, bluebirds for the past two months in Cumberland, Forside, Maine. Am I missing any, Janie? I, uh, Peregrine Falcons, Two Bass River. Oh, the Brewster, nice in Beverly. Uh, Raven in Manchester, Essex Woods from Robert Bucksbaum. There's Sandhill Crane in Nashua. Ah. Oh. The Tom mm. Young sighted and three more in West Cague Marsh in Thomaston, Maine. So singing ruby crowns and Parker River in the pines, 70 roll, 70 plus red poles in Jericho, Vermont, snipe. Still seeing bald eagles in southwest Missouri. <laughs> Great. We, we've, <laughs> well, had, we've had um bluebirds and is it coming over? We've had bluebirds and um what riding in? Uh, he was old out to... We've had bluebirds and woodcock in Milton. Nice. Excellent. It's Vermont. No Vermont. <laughs> oh. Okay. Thanks for yeah. thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> Fox sparrows in Newbury in Middlesex, Vermont. Eat my from Virginia, hummingbirds are on their way. Thank you. Send them, send them, but yes. hopefully it's a little warmer out here. Thank you. Um, well, it's great. Clearly, <laughs> things are opening up. You know, there have been points during this winter where I couldn't get a peep out of people, and now, man, the birdies really <laughs> picked up. So uh, I hope I see you out there soon and, uh, and enjoy it. Um, I'm going to move on now. Uh, Don Paul, if you would uh, like to present a book of the month for us tonight. I would. And uh, for, for April, our meeting, uh, this book is in honor of um, our speaker tonight because this book is uh, by, the, the writings in it are by a 19th century French entomologist. Um, and he was also, you know, in the fashion of those days, he was also sort of a, a generalist naturalist, um, but primarily known as an entomologist. Uh, Jean-Henri Fabre, um, this cover is sort of hard to read, um, but if you can see some of the illustrations, they are just gorgeous. And there are a lot of um, insects uh, in here, uh, watercolors by Marlene McLaughlin. Um, so the writings in the book are from the 19th century. The, uh, the artist who did the watercolors is a contemporary artist, uh, Marlene McLaughlin, uh, here's her a dragonfly of some sort. Um, we'll, we'll know what it is, but probably by the end of this meeting, I'm sure. Um, and then there's, uh, she's you know, done other. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. Beauty of this work. It's one of those books that's just a wonderful to, to hold. It's really well made, uh, hardcover. Uh, the, um, all the watercolors have been reproduced beautifully. And then, um, February was a, is a wonderful writer, was a wonderful writer. And so um, if you can get hold of this, it was um, printed in, uh, this one was uh, published in 1998. So I don't know if uh, it's still in print, but I'm sure you can get, you can get any of these online. Uh, so th there it is, mm. some lovely insects. Thank you, Don. That You're welcome. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Janie Winchell. She'll introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, she's the ECOC Program Director and Director of the Art and Nature Center of the Peabody Essex Museum. Janie. Thanks, Constance. Greetings, everyone near and far, and welcome to Insects for Birders with Brian Pfeiffer. 
Uh, as Constance mentioned, I'm Janie Winchell. I'm here with the Peabody Essex Museum and with the club as the person who kind of joins the two organizations together. And this um, event is co-hosted by both ECOC and the museum. I also wanna give a special thank you to the ECHO Charitable Foundation for making this program tonight a possibility. And uh, we're very grateful for that support. Now it's my distinct privilege to introduce Brian Pfeiffer, joining us from his home in Montpelier, Vermont, a field biologist, nature writer, and self-described boy explorer. Brian is perhaps best known for being a gifted teacher. Over the course of three decades, he has guided literally thousands of people to the discovery of birds and insects. Some of you are here tonight, I believe. Brian co-founded the Vermont Butterfly Survey and is its principal field lepidopterist. He is also a principal investigator on the Vermont Damselfly and Dragonfly Survey. He has collected, watched, and photographed insects from the tropics of Central America to above the Arctic Circle in Scandinavia. His essays have appeared in the New York Times, Orion, and Field and Stream, among others. Brian now consults with the University of Vermont's Field Naturalist Program and is at work on two books, a collection of essays called Flight, A Year with Airborne Animals and, Plant and Pantala. Oh, and Pantala, a dragonfly tells us about sex, evolution, and human condition. You can find his blog posts, photographs, and so much more online at his site, which is brianpfeiffer.com, and Brian with a Y. Um, so that will, you know, that'll help you find it. Before I turn the program over to Brian, just a quick reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box for him to answer at the end of his talk, or feel free to wait and ask your questions in person um, at the close of his presentation. And now without further ado, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Brian and make sure you're on mute, except for Brian. Welcome, Brian. <laughs> Thanks, Janie. Thanks, Constance. And what a treat to be here. It's, it, you know, everyone says it's an honor. And this is a particular honor for me, um, in large part because, you know, I'm really a birder who picked up a butterfly net and a camera. You know, I'm a birder from way back. And for the better part of four decades, you know, I've birded in Essex County a lot. And um, I've chased a lot of birds there over the years. And I've, you know, I've been to Andrews Point and not seen but a fraction of the birds that Rick Heil sees there, you know. I've, I've missed a lot of the birds that Jim Barry finds at Marblehead Neck. And I've, um, I don't know, probably not see plenty of the birds that uh, Barbara Vocal has seen at Halibut Point. So I sort of feel as if I know many of you. You're, you're among my heroes and the club, of course, is, um, has a storied and distinguished tradition and pedigree. So it really is a thrill for me to be here. And you know, I, I'm gonna, maybe I'll start the program now. So the other great thing that I love, you know, I love the fact that the museum is part of this, that the museum and the club have come together for this because, you know, the, the club's mission is to promote interest in ornithological study, I'm reading from the mission now, in conservation of birds and their habitats in Essex County. Well, you can't do that without insects. And the mission of the museum includes, its mission is like increase knowledge, enrich the spirit, engage the mind, and stimulate the senses. And I know of no organisms that do that better than insects. So I think what we're gonna do is, you know, we are going to sort of tonight explore the nexus of birds birding, insects, you know, and then to quote from the museum, knowledge, spirit, the mind and the senses. Um, and, you know, we'll start with a warm up here and, you know, um, just to sort of get us rolling, we'll look at a few birds, red knot, Red Admiral. 
Common Nighthawk, Common Sand Dragon. Painted Bunting, Painted Lady. This, by the way, is the underside of a Painted Lady. Painted Skimmer, Owl Eyes, and Owl-Eyed Bird Dropping Moth. And Owl-Eyed Bird Dropping Moth near actual bird droppings. I don't think I see my cursor there. Can you see my cursor lower right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, three Waddled Bellbird and Three Spotted Skipper. Okay, I'll admit some of the insects are not nearly as dramatic as the bird equivalent. Baltimore Oriole in Baltimore checker spot. So what are we talking about here? Well, you know, these numbers may or may not be right. You know, world bird diversity, I don't know what it is now, somewhere around 10 or 11,000 species. But the point here is that, you know, insect diversity is just sick. <laughs> it's just beyond description. Like if you were to look at, you know, moth and butterfly diversity alone in the world, we're looking at the, at least 160,000 described species, you know. Um, we know of, we've described about a million insect species and there are probably five to 10 million of them. The vast majority of them are undescribed. So we are, what I'm gonna try to do for you in less than an hour tonight is get you inspired. This is a bit more inspired inspirational than instructional. Um, I want to encourage you, if you're not yet looking at insects, I want to encourage you to do this. And, um, oh, by the way, uh, purple sandpiper and great purple hair streak. So we're going to sort of look at this from a birder's perspective. And I think probably the best way to do this is to Give you a top 10 list. Forgive me, I'm doing that a little bit on the cheap here. But um, I'm going to give you 10 reasons why, beyond this astonishing beauty and diversity, I'm going to give you 10 reasons why you might want to, once you're done birding, start looking at insects. And, you know, I think the first and foremost is you already know this. You already know how to do this. If you're looking at birds, the skills that you have and the gear that you have sets you up for this nicely. You've been at this for a while. You know what it's like to look at an organism in nature and you know its challenges and its joys and its delights. So you can do this if you're not already doing it um, because you've got the skills for it. Yeah, you know, close focusing binoculars are really handy because you're gonna be looking at things, not like these hawk watchers, but stuff at your feet. Um, but you know this game you know the harmony of families. And yes, the diversity is shocking and daunting and overwhelming, but here are the six butterfly families in the world. Like think about all the bird families you know. Well, guess what? There are only six butterfly families. And if you know them here, all six of them are on this continent, you will know them when you see them around the world. Um, and you know, rather than go through chapter and verse tonight, like what makes a swallowtail a swallowtail or what makes a skipper a skipper, um, I'm going to instead sort of, I don't know, help justify your thing to think about these animals and look at them. And I'll probably, what I, what I tend to do in these talks is I just put some pictures up on the screen and then stuff starts coming out of my mouth and unrehearsed and I never quite know what I'm going to say. I will occasionally wander and every one of these has stories. This one in the upper right, I don't believe you will see a member of this family in Massachusetts. Um, but these are called metal marks. They, they tend to be southern and tropical. But, you know, as if butterflies alone weren't beautiful enough, you know, evolution by means of natural selection saw fit to include like glitter on their wings, making them even more attractive. You know, you might know a swallowtail when you see one, you know, rather than likening them to swallows, the swallows that we know, I don't know, 
I might compare them more to herons instead. They're big, they're showy, they're easy to see, they're easy to identify, relatively easy. So, you know, here, if you want sparrows, you want sparrows among butterflies, we got them for you in the Hesperiidae, the skippers. These are identification challenges. The nymphalids, the nymphalidae, the brushfoots, I don't know, they're kind of like the passerines, a lot of diversity, a lot of showiness. So, you know, the family, um, the harmony families is a tool that you know and know that it works among insects. Not all of them. <laughs> these are moths. And these are moths, I believe, let me look here. These are moths that I've encountered without any great effort. The ones that you see photographed against like a wooden panel or a, a mesh, white mesh, they came to my house. They, they came to the light at my house. Moth diversity is insane, it's challenging, it is wonderful. These animals come to you. Um, I don't know, I'll pick something here. These, if you see these little silver, these little golden and white long things, these are grass veneers. Uh, most, the male, most or all of them. And, the, um, and they're these little grass moths that fly in. Um, so, the, you know, family level identification is doable, but challenging because we've got, yes, we've got identifiable families in butterflies. We have tremendous diversity in moths, wonderfully so. Like Massachusetts probably has, I don't know, 105, 110 species of butterfly, I'm guessing and certainly more than 2,000 species of moth. Uh, that's the case in Vermont, for example. So I don't know, I point this one up, lower right, this thing, which is called beautiful wood nymph in genus Eudryas. Um, I photographed that at my house, and I kid you not, the very next morning I was sitting on my porch under a sugar maple, and the red-eyed vireo took a shit on my pant leg. And it looked like that. And there's my lousy iPhone photo of it. But it looked, it reminded me of the beautiful wood nymph I photographed the night before. So, you know, whether those two things look alike, it's up to you, you know, I report, you decide. Um, this is a really wonderful moth. When it opens its wings, it looks like that. Again, that was at my house. Um, some of you who've dabbled in this stuff might know that, wait a minute, or maybe if you haven't, you might know that, well, wait a minute, Brian, like all these butterflies, they just look like orange and black things to me. You know, like, how do you begin to deal with this? Like, I'm done for the night and I can't discern. These are four different species of fritillary. And like, you may look at them and say to yourself, well, I just can't deal with that. These look like impidnax flycatchers to me. But guess what? You know, these, this, this group of fritillaries, these wonderful butterflies, many of which are boreal species, northern species, they are readily identifiable by looking at the undersides of their wings. And the patterns on them are striking and definitive. And for those of you who know this genus, I'm, I'm, I'm rubbing it in with photos of some really rare fritillary species. Um, all but that lower left one I photographed in the United States. That lower left one I photographed in Norway. But, you know, if you can't deal with this, you can certainly deal with this. And the, the way you deal with them is the way that you've always dealt with identifying wildlife. Field marks, you know? Like, here are two ladies, painted lady and American lady. And yeah, you might not first know how to approach this, but once you know that this, this black ring here, this black markings on the forewing, is closed on the painted lady and open on the American lady. And that little white dot is a legitimate field mark. You can say, okay, I know how to do this. Like I know how to look at a wing bar or an eye ring. It's the same thing with insects, lots of these insects, you know? Painted lady has four spectacular or five spectacular spots on the underside of its wing. And American lady has two big spots on the other side of the swing. So field marks, you know, you could do this and you've got um, field guides for doing this, for helping you along, just as we've always done with birds. Here are two fritillaries and, you know, discounting the color differences now, these are members of two different genera. And the more you do this, you know, the more time you spend with insects, looking at them in the same way you've looked at birds, 
the differences between these two genera. You know, on the right, it's one of the greater fritillaries, and on the left, it's one of the lesser fritillaries. And luckily, there are no medium fritillaries. Um, but the differences in these two genera will become as obvious to you as the differences between an Impidnax flycatcher and a Contopus flycatcher. You know, least flycatcher on the left and Eastern Wood Peewee on the right. Like when you first started birding, you know, maybe you struggled with these, but the more time you spend with insects, you're gonna start seeing differences that you kind of never knew you would get eventually or understand. It comes to you because you've done it with birds. And the resources are tremendous. Um, I will not go into detail about this tonight, but you can pick just about any group of insects you like, and um, there's a field guide for that. Not only is there might be a North American field guide for it, but there might be regional field guides for you. Um, the explosion of insect field guides has been shocking and astonishing and wonderful. What I will do for everyone, so you don't have to remember things tonight, I will have on my website by Monday, a page with all these resources that I can share with you. Like you decide you want to do this, you, you listen to the talk and you say, okay, this guy might be onto something tonight. Um, and you want to look into it some more, I will share on my page and you, you're going to be able to get that, get to mine through the, through the ECOC's website. So you'll go back there and you'll find a link to all sorts of resources that I'm going to give you because I want you to do this. I want you to discover these things. Um, and to help you along are lots of options. There is a lot of online learning, a lot of, you know, in-person learning that we will, that will resume soon. The Massachusetts Butterfly Club, for example, has field trips, just like any good birding group. Um, this out, lower left, Biodiversity University is um, run out of the North Branch Nature Center here in Montpelier, Vermont, offering field seminars, as does Eagle Hill in Steuben, Maine. Um, there are lots of opportunities for you to learn, and I will include those resources on my webpage for you as well. So you can get out and do this, and it really does help to learn from a person. You know, just think about how you learn birding. Um, I'll get back to this sort of more strategies lower right here, some of my rants about how best to learn these things uh, in a little bit. So, um, you know, point number two, insects tend to be more reliable than birds. And um, I don't know, this is a generalization. Everything about, an ins everything about insects is a generalization because of the diversity is so tremendous. What do I mean by that? Well, you might go to, um, southeastern Arizona. And yeah, you know, you might see northern beardless tarantula up there on your left with some work. It's a, it's a specialty there. You may or may not bump into Montezuma quail. You know, it's, it can be hit or mess. It can be tough. I photographed both of these in Arizona. Um, but these are specialties and, you know, yeah, you're probably going to find them. You might not. But you can also go to some of the hot spots, the birding hot spots, and I photographed all three of these in exactly the places I knew they would be and where they were when I went. So like that beauty on the left is called Blue Metal Mark, and I photographed it at Resaca de la Palma Park along the Rio Grande in Texas in a, in a butterfly garden. And it's really one of the only places in North America to find it. I went there the right time of year, there it was. This festive dragonfly on the right is, um, oh gosh, it's a Pedagonthus utania. Its common name is um, uh, blue-faced ringtail. And there is only one known site for this in the US. And I went there in July of 2019 and there it was. That beetle I photographed in, the, in Chiricahua National Monument while birding. That thing is, uh oh, common names are eluding me. That's a Chrysina um, Bayeri, or I can't, but, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a scarab beetle with purple legs. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was not hard to find these insects when I went there. 
a lot easier than finding bird specialties there. A little closer to home, you might head north into the bogs and, you know, yeah, you'll, you'll probably see gray jay. They're a bit cooperative. Um, spruce grouse is hit or miss. You know, American three-toed woodpecker is tough. Um, so birds, specialty birds and bogs are tough. But, you know, here are six insects that I found with relative ease. You know, I could, by the way, um, virtually all the photos in this talk tonight are mine. I photograph virtually everything you're seeing here. And yeah, I went out of my way to photograph some of these, but, you know, I saw all these things sort of in the course of my being out there and birding and looking for insects and kind of being a geeky naturalist with a net and a camera and a pair of binoculars. So yes, some of the stuff takes extra effort, but you know, like, oh, I don't know, this thing in the upper left, this thing is called sedge sprite. You go to a bog and these things live there. They live in, I'm sorry, it's called sphagnum sprite. They live in sphagnum. And when you go there, if you go at the right time of year, you can almost be guaranteed of finding that if it's at a known site by the thousands. They flood, this thing's no bigger than a, like a party toothpick. They float around like little threads in the bog. Um, I won't go into all these, but you know, this thing on the upper right, that's a regal fritillary. That's a butterfly that's all but extirpated in the East. It used to fly in, in, in New England states. It was in Massachusetts. It was in Maine. They're gone now. They remain on a, on a military site in Pennsylvania, a protected site. It still flies in the tall grass prairie. I went to Missouri to go find it. I went to the right prairie and there it was. This thing here, which is called, oh, Calipistria mollissima. This is called pink-sided fern moth. This thing came to my house. You know, I turned on the light and there it was. So, you know, all of these insects, this thing on the right, this dragonfly on the right middle, this is one of the rarest insects I've ever seen. It's called ringed bog haunter. It is globally rare, globally imperiled. It's known from just a few sites in New England over toward the Midwest. I photographed that in central Massachusetts in a known site for it. So this thing on lower right, this Pepto-Bismol colored moth, it's called primrose moth. Shinia, Florida. You just look around on your evening primroses in July and August and you'll bump into that thing sucking nectar during the day. That thing on the left is a rare tiger beetle called cobblestone tiger beetle. I found it in Connecticut River, right where it was supposed to be. So, you know, what do I mean by reliable? If you know where these animals are and when they fly, um, odds are they'll be there for you and accessible. And what we have to help us find them are again, more resources, more online resources. Um, think about eBird. So think if you're looking for a bird with eBird, well, we now have essentially eBird for insects and eBird for everything. You know, here is iNaturalist. Will I talk about, I, I'll talk about iNaturalist in a little bit, but this is eButterfly. This is basically eBird for butterflies. This is Odinatus Central. This is basically, you know, eBird for dragonflies. This is the Vermont dragonfly and damselfly survey. So as we learn about these organisms, we share uh, data that you also provide, it's citizen science, about where they are and when they're there. And once you know where and when, you can find them. So this is my friend Kristen Linquist, who's, who's here tonight. We were in a bog in Maine, and it's a, it's one of the very, very few sites in the US for this tiny butterfly. About the size of your thumbnail, it's called crowberry blue. And you know, you will start seeing the spring azures around, those little blue butterflies that are often on the roads and when they fly, they flash blue at you uh, in April. And, uh, this one is exceedingly rare. Its host plant is black crowberry, and you will only find it at like a half a dozen sites in Washington County, Maine. Nowhere else in the eastern U.S., and you will find it farther north than that. So it's at the southern extent of its range. Here it is on a um, cotton grass, and when this thing opens its wings, this is what you get.
This is why we call them blues or azures. So, you know, we were there because we knew that was a site for this butterfly, um, exceedingly rare, and there it was, like within camera view, you know, oops, sorry. So, so we know, once we know where they are, we can go find them. They're a lot easier to photograph than birds, let me tell you. So point number three, um, insect encounters are often more intimate than most bird encounters. Like, what do I mean by that? Well, I think I just mean this, you know, we get close to them. You know, think about birding. You all know this routine. Um, that's a group I was leading in Northern Vermont. We were looking at warblers and, you know, we were seeing good stuff. You know, I, you know, I have to say that, you know, one great thing about Vermont is, yeah, we don't have metal mark butterflies either, but we got Northern breeding warblers. And if you, if you haven't watched warblers during the breeding season teed up and singing on territory, then you haven't seen warblers. A lot of us have seen warblers only in migration. Like think about palm warbler, how few people in Massachusetts actually see them breeding. You know, palm warblers sit up like this Blackburnian warbler, you know, in the breeding season in the bogs up here. Um, so, you know, they can be flighty. Upper left, that is the hawk watching platform at Benson Rio Grande State Park. We were looking at gray hawk, among other things, including hook billed kite there. And then this lower left shot, that was at High Island, Texas. Oh, we had a good bird there. That was um, fork tailed flycatcher that kind of flew in. So, yeah, you know, we find these birds, but you know, you know how difficult birding can be. Well, here are some insect watchers at the light there we were looking at this thing called harris's three spot um upper left my pal josh link my pals josh lincoln and laura godette they were photographing this little damselfly called citrine forktail and i have to say they were photographing this very damselfly when they were done i snuck in and took a picture and that's the same situation for Josh in some pine rocklands in Florida. He was photographing that little skipper on the left called Baracoa skipper. And at that site, um, I happened to find one and only one of this exceedingly rare butterfly called Bartram scrub hair streak. Only one. It's federally listed. You know, Florida's doing terrible things to butterflies by spraying pesticides and developing habitat, but it was there. You know, I was a known site and I found it. I found one and gosh, it could have been the last one. So, um, you know, we these things are accessible to us and we can look at them in many ways. Um, actually, Bruce in the middle, there's Bruce and Tom are here tonight. We were photographing a dragonfly that I'll admit, full disclosure here, Cliff didn't catch it um but we we i mean clark schiffer didn't catch it but cliff burnswag uh caught this dragonfly and we posed it um and when they were done photographing it i stepped in and it was this thing called comet darner nx longipedes this thing races around ponds like a missile really hard to catch um but there it was for us you know like uh within our grasp at our just basically in front of us for us to photograph all we wanted and, you know after we posed it it sat a while and then it flew off so you know insect encounters tend to be more intimate we're closer to these animals they they're in our spaces <laughs> um okay reason number four the sex is way better among insects now i can't again that's a generalization and it's probably designed to um you know lure you into this group into watching these animals more so but as we know if you've ever seen birds copulate um well the first thing to know about um it's brief you know and i'll get to that in a second i think but yes bird courtship and reproduction has led to some fabulous um evolution of beauty and antics and armaments on earth you know 
That's a resplendent Quetzal that I photographed in Costa Rica. That's a greater sage grouse I shot in um, Idaho. And that peacock was in New Mexico. So we know what courtship uh, and what sexual selection does for us in birds. Even in this one, you know, that's there's some fabulous displays. Ruby count kinglets will be coming through soon. Now they're probably they're in Massachusetts. They're going to show up in a week or two here in Vermont. And, you know, they do displays like this and they they display in some really wonderful and dramatic ways for us. Um, bird copulation tends to be short. You know, these uh, trogans in Arizona, I happened to hear commotion. I looked up, I got three photos, including this. There's the male, there's the female. That lasted a few seconds, a cloacal kiss, bird copulation. Then they separated. And he sat for a while near me and I was able to photograph him, but then he was gone, you know? That was the end of it, he was gone. Um, insects are different, you know? When they copulate, they do it for a long time and they do it in plain sight. These are copulating fireflies. This one on the right is a little more graphic than we might want, but they copulate, you know, tip to tip, the ends of their abdomens typically. And after they copulate, females lay eggs. And this is not something that you normally see birds do, you know, unless you've got chickens. This is a, a spectacular moth. I don't know that I have a picture of the full thing for you. This is um, Platarctia parthenos, I believe. It's St. Lawrence tiger moth. This was a moth that we had caught and set on a leaf and she just started to lay eggs. So there's an intimacy here and we get closer to their wonderful life cycles, their life histories. And this, this copulation is easy, is easy to photograph. There's a lot of interesting things going on. These are called bog coppers, Lycina epizanthi that I photographed at a bog in Ontario copulating. And many of you, you know, if you, oh, you know, I actually wasn't gonna include this in the talk, but it slipped in here. So I'm gonna probably have to do it now. Let's see if I can keep this short for you. Um, so many of you know that the, you know, among birds, there is courtship um, and there is a short copulation and it's wonderful. Among ducks, there really isn't courtship. There, you know, isn't even dinner in a movie. Uh, ducks, male ducks do forced copulations on females. They basically seize females and, and copulate with um, a term, and, but the other thing is that, you know, male birds don't have phalluses. They really, for the most part, don't have penises, except for waterfowl and a few other groups. And um, in these forest copulations, ducks will do what we, what, what biologists, you know, no um, strangers to understatement or obfuscation call explosive aversion. I, I probably shouldn't go into detail here, but um, if you know the work of Patty Brannan and Rick Prom, they've looked at duck copulation. And the basic strategy here is, and it amounts to coevolution, males, and if you didn't believe me, males have these corkscrew penises that they can avert in a fraction of a second during a copulation with a female into her reproductive tract. And in order to ward off these unwanted copulations, a female may not be able to prevent the forced copulation by a male, but she can prevent fertilization because she has a countervailing reproductive tract. His may go counterclockwise, but hers goes clockwise. And it allows her to prevent what's really most important, um, fertilization. Yes, she still faces far more burdens than males do uh, in the in the rigors of reproduction, uh, no secret there. But this form of coevolutions, males developing one strategy of reproduction, a female developing something to protect her own reproductive self-interests, uh, coevolution in action, and so we see that in ducks. We also see it in insects. You know, um, dragonflies have some of the oddest copulation strategies and mating strategies in the animal kingdom. 
rather than copulating like other insects tip to tip, they form these odd copulatory wheels. Like this is a male. These are um, called, uh-oh, these are called four, five striped forcep tails. This is um, Phylogon foides, um, Alber guy. These are um, dragonflies that I photographed in Texas. But the point here is this is a male. He's got a female grasped at the end of his abdomen by the scruff of her neck. She has reached forward to uh, link up with him in this copulatory pose. And there isn't a lot of displaying. There's not a lot of courtship. These, these animals are not, for the most part, displaying like birds of paradise. There is a, essentially multiple and coercive copulation among dragonflies. But when they get in this position, there's some really, really interesting biology happening and really interesting coevolution happening that we could do another talk on, um, in, you know, on another night. I could spend an hour talking about dragonfly sex. But the point here is that it's interesting and different and it's accessible. You know, these are uh, some really common skippers called long dashes that were copulating and I just stuck my finger under them and they went about their business on my fingertip. So the the intimacy and the um, and the and the fascination that goes with reproduction is more accessible among insects and really, really sort of offers really great opportunities for study and understanding in these in, in these animals. Point number five and this one, you know, I think birders need this one. And that is this relationship between insects and plants. So here's a pair of Baltimore checker spots. They happen to be copulating on a Joe Pye weed just about to bloom. They're not really interested in the Joe Pye weed. They, they happen to be copulating there. But as we know, insects have this wonderful shared evolution with plants. So after copulating an insect, this is a different checker spot. This one's called Harris's checker spot. But females will go off and lay eggs. And I saw this female, I photographed her in Maine, and she was upside down on this leaf. And I looked underneath the leaf after this, and you can just see her abdomen touching the bottom of the leaf. She's laying eggs. And she laid this little array of these beautiful yellow eggs on the underside of a flat-topped aster, because that's the only plant she lays her eggs on. And in this case, these are eggs on a Baltimore checker spots plant, one of them called um, uh, white turtle head, Chelone glabra. So insects, you know, their lives intertwine with plants in some really wonderful ways. And you know this life cycle. An insect lays an egg. From that egg, and this is a Baltimore checker spot caterpillar. It emerges, it eats and grows. It pupates into a chrysalis. This is a Baltimore checker spot chrysalis. And from that chrysalis, there will emerge a Baltimore checker spot. So there's this life cycle that we see played out among plants and this relationship with plants. And I think one thing that insects has done for me, you know, yeah, you know, I might know that a Bicknell's thrush likes high elevation spruce and fir, you know, the Krumholtz in the mountains here in New England in the Canadian Maritimes. But the more time I spend with insects, and here are three, you know, the more time I learn more about insect plant interactions and I learn about plants. And I love it. Um, on the left, that's a dog bane beetle hanging out on common dog bane. So you go learn common dog bane and start looking on common dog bane and you'll see that beetle. Uh, monarch and milkweed, we know it well on, lower, on the lower right. This lovely skipper, this is my favorite photograph from 2020. Um, this thing's called Leonard Skipper and it's nectaring on the New England blazing star in Maine. I think that's its name. I spent six hours at this one plant photographing these butterflies on a lovely day in late July. And I had a wonderful time watching them come and go to these flowers. And because I love that butterfly, I really loved the flowers. And even um, animals that don't have that intimate relationship with flowers, laying their eggs on them, for example, these are three dragonflies in the genus Cordulogaster. They're called spike tails, really dramatic, showy dragonflies. This one on the left is called 
delta spotted spike tail. It's got these little delta spots on the side. There's another set on the other side of its abdomen. This one's got its arrowheads on the dorsal side only of its abdomen. This is called arrowhead spike tail. And this one, really rare, rare in Massachusetts. We've recently found it in Vermont. It's called tiger spike tail. So three different spike tail species. You'd see them in a field guide. You'd be able to identify them with those field marks. I was in the Southeast with some friends um, in 2019, I think it was. We were looking for this spike tail called, oh, Saracenia spike tail. And if you know Saracenia, you know that Saracenia is the genus for pitcher plants. And these are not like New England pitcher plants. This is called Saracenia leucophila or leucophila. This is, I think it's called white pitcher plant. They're really tall and they are just gorgeous. I fell for these plants big time when I went looking for the dragonfly. Um, you know, these look like veins and I would think that they are so attractive to any insect that would enter that pitcher plant and perish there. These are, these are carnivorous plants but they were just so spectacular. They were in piney woods where, you know, we were seeing red cockaded woodpeckers as well. That's a, this, the stuff behind it is a um, butterwort that was flowering. And so like with insects, I've come to love plants even more because of their association with plants. We were photographing, you know, we were photographing um, damselflies in this little, this little peatland with these, with these uh, pitcher plants. And I think that just in the same way that birds, it gets us to really cool places, insects get us to really beautiful places. I have a particular fondness for bogs. This is a bog I visited in Maine for some work I'm doing for the state of Maine, chasing rare butterflies. That's my friend, Josh. Those are your utricularia, by the way, bladderworts, those yellow flowers there. And over the course of my chasing dragonflies and butterflies and bogs. I've been lucky enough to find like a lot of orchids and a lot of other plants. So these are four plants only that I've managed to photograph, you know, out while looking for insects. This one is, I don't believe, I don't know if it's in Massachusetts. I photographed that one, Calypso orchid in Colorado at high elevation looking for dragonflies. I think it's gone from Vermont now. But these are not unusual plants at all. This is bog laurel, that's andromeda, bog rosemary, and that's grass pink, calopogon. So, you know, we spend time in places looking for insects and you can't help but see beautiful nature, see plants that are just shockingly beautiful. These things like erupt like little purple flames and violet flames across the bogs. And I can think of no place I'd rather be in June at the height of biting insect season than in places like these with these flowers looking for insects. So, okay. So some practical stuff. And a lot of this will be um, on that page for you. You can learn and study and enjoy insects in the same way you do with as you do with birds, you know, you look at them through binos, you know, some of the first great butterfly field guides for us, one's called butterflies through binoculars. Um, I have to say, if you really want to learn insects and know them, you know, it really helps to catch them. And I love catching insects and looking at them and teaching with them, letting kids see them, letting my students see them and then letting them go. You know, it is um, part of that intimacy. It's part of the way we learn them and learn to love them and know them and know their diversity. So consider getting a net, you know, consider being serious enough to catch these insects and look at them and, and have that intimacy with them. It really does help you learn. You know, you catch them, you're not gonna do this with the bird. You know, you're not gonna have like an impidnax flycatcher in the hand. But, you know, you might have a, that thing flew away. That's another Harris's checker spot. And it flew away after we uh, ID'd it in the field guide. The other thing is to get wet. You know, we do it while birding. That's on the Cape. That's Blair Nicola there, uh, second from right. 
we were looking at shorebirds, you know, um, on the Cape. And, you know, that's how you look at shorebirds. It's the best way to look at shorebirds. You know, it's a great way to be with insects, particularly dragonflies. Like, you need to be with them in their places, in their habitats. You need to see them on their terms. So, like, you know, we bring our camera gear, we lose some of our camera gear, we bring our nets. Uh, that's my friend and colleague, Mike Blust. He was photographing this little damselfly called Scarlet Bluet. Um, and if you don't like that, there's another one called Burgundy Bluet. So, um, these are tiny little damselflies, you know, little bluets, the little tiny blue damselflies that we see commonly. They're not all blue. So, you know, my point here is to like get with them, go to their habitats. I spend a lot of time in fields in the summer rolling around photographing butterflies and tick checks are simply a part of my life. You know, like I do my best at protection. But when I come home every night, I check myself for ticks because that closeness with the habitat is not something I want to sacrifice. I don't want to be, I will be prudently cautious, but I still want to have that boy-like exuberance. And I want to be in these places with these insects. So that's what I'm going to do. You know, I've emerged from ponds like this with leeches on me, but I wouldn't trade it at all. I would bear far worse. Um, to be with these insects. So, you know, this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna tell you tonight. And so I don't know how to tell this to you. I don't want you to read what I've written. I'm gonna give you a link to this um, rant. It's not a rant, it's, a, it's an argument. Um, not um, necessarily celebrating the tactile pleasures of books over apps, you know, but I think that if you want to learn nature, you shouldn't do it on a glowing screen. Yes, there are lots of uh, ways that you can, you know, complement your learning on glowing screens, and we'll talk about those in a bit, but I think you should learn with books. And I don't want you to, I'm going to, here, I'm going to give you another slide. I don't want you reading this. I don't want you to distract your attention. I want you to focus on me. Okay, that's not a great way for you to focus on me right now. I could either let you look at that or you could look at, you know, first cycle herring gulls. So my guess is you'd rather look at that. But what I want you to do is I want you to focus on what I'm about to say. I'm going to go back here for a second. Um, Remember how we used to learn books before, you know, Al Gore invented the internet, you know? We used to take our field guides out into the field with us. Or when I learned birds, I went out with someone who knew birds. And I'd say, what's that? He'd say, it's a cardinal. I'd look at it and I'd write it in my book. I'd handwrite it in my field book. And I had a list of all the birds I'd seen that day when I got home. And I looked again at my field guide when I got home and I went page by page through my field guide. Did I see any loons today? No. Any grebes today? No. Did I, oh, but I saw, you know, I saw these ducks today. So the beauty of field guides is, and you can see it here in my example of Don Eckleberry's grebes, you know, his grebe plate. When you look through a field guide, when you leaf through the pages of your field guide and you see the grebes together and what it means to be a grebe and what makes or what makes a vireo a vireo and not a flycatcher. You see them on pages. You start to get to a sense of this harmony of families. And I just don't think you can get that learning with apps, certainly on the small screens. Yes, these apps will help you identify birds on the cheap, you know, but I, I equate apps to, um, I equate them to, you know, learning a language with phrase books. You know, you'll get by, you'll be wrong a lot, and you won't fundamentally know grammar and verb conjugation. So what I like to say is when it comes to learning nature, when you want to learn butterflies or dragonflies, it's like movies. You know, the book is better. Get a book. And I'm going to give you ideas for books and spend time with your book. Um, yes, apps are going to be great in the same way you use an app because you can't remember 
some field mark like you know, I can't remember, does Willow Flycatcher say wit or pip? Or you're wondering about, you're hearing some odd Myarchus Flycatcher call note and you're saying, oh, what is that? It sounds familiar. It seems like a rare one. Yes, apps are great for that. Or checking some field marks that you, you just can't quite conjure in the moment. But when you're starting from scratch and learning, learn with a book, please. I mean, that's my my philosophy on this and spend time looking through your book um you know i could spend the rest of the night describing my experiences with these six insects um you know if we have time maybe i'll come back to them i'll just tell you one this little bee on top here it's on a flower that i absolutely love called parnassia glauca i believe fen grass of parnassus and I've been looking at that, at that flower in a few spots in Vermont here for years, for decades. And then I learned last summer that there was an exceedingly rare bee that associated with that flower that I'd probably seen before and never even noticed, you know? But once I knew it was there, I went back to one of my fen grass of Parnassus sites and I hung out there for a while. And there is the bee that has rarely been photographed on its flower and it nectars only on this plant. Um, and it's an exceedingly rare bee. So, you know, here's something that I, a flower that I've been looking at for decades and suddenly along comes this little tiny rare bee that I got to experience. Again, I spent half a day with them on these flowers and I loved every minute of it. So, and again, all of these insects I photographed, yeah, some of them I went out of my way for, um, but not that hard to photograph, to be honest with you. So, um, okay, you don't have to deal with first winter herring gulls, although I have to say this one's showing a lot of paleness at the base of the beer bill for a first cycle herring gull, but we don't have to deal with that. So yes, um, learn in books, but also know that there are online resources. And if you are not a user of iNaturalist, if you don't know iNaturalist, you got to get with iNaturalist. Um, and again, I could go on, I don't even know what time it is, but I could go on long and wonderfully and rhapsodically about iNaturalist. But I queried iNaturalist the other day for insects in Essex County, 7,500 observations, 1,200 insect species are already all mapped like eBird in iNaturalist in Essex County alone. So, you know, you want butterflies? There's eButterfly. You know this if you know eBird. Essex County butterflies, already 58, this is a relatively new resource, 58 species in there. Um, Essex County dragonfly data, there it is mapped for you. So um, yes, use these online resources. They're tremendously helpful, not only for learning um, when you're not looking at a book, but also where to go. Like, where can I find butterflies? Go online and find butterfly sites. So now in a nod to, to the museum, briefly, um, I want to mention insects as art. This is on Monhegan Island. This is out toward um, Blackhead on Monhegan. And in that red circle is a butterfly that landed. I had my super zoom camera. That's my shadow there. It was late in the day. And so I mega zoomed this thing and took a picture of it. And that is one of those painted ladies. And I'm sorry, that is art to me. You know, like if you're not looking closely at the underside of this butterfly and seeing whatever, Jackson Pollock, fabulous colors, um, then I think you're missing an aesthetic that goes with insects beyond their status as, you know, otherworldly and biting and creepy crawly and scary. Butterflies are, you know, perhaps the best examples of that, of course. And um, I tend to spend some time around museum collections and I find butterfly, I hate to say this, I find butterflies arranged on pins um, um, satisfying, not because it's they are simply beautiful, but because they are knowledge gathered for us. These are tropical butterflies. We won't see these close to home, but this is data and information and biodiversity at our fingertips. And the museum collections that we have that are still around, you know, are vital to what we now know about these insects. 
They aid our field guides. They help me um, tremendously. I try to spend time every winter with museum collections. This is in Florida at the uh, McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity. So are these. These are some of those fritillaries, some of which we have in the East and in the West. Um, and, you know, I, to me, this is art, not because it's beautiful, but because, you know, as part of the Peabody Essex Museum's um, mission, it increases my knowledge, it enriches my spirit, it engages my mind, and hey, it stimulates my senses. So um, that's art. Um, so is this. When butterflies emerge, by the way, they often have drop, a little droplet of liquid will come from the tip of their abdomens. And there's a science center in, I think it's in California. They put canvas underneath butterflies. And this is basically butterfly, newly emerged butterfly poop as art. And I think we've seen elephants and chimpanzees make arts. Butterflies can make art as well. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now with um, eight, nine, 10, maybe 11. That's sort of my um, addition, additional sort of nexus of birds, birding, and insects. Uh, and there are these elements of it. And bear with me here. We're winding down. But, you know, migration is something that, you know, we birders know and love. And take black pole warbler that makes this unbelievable transoceanic migration every fall. It'll leave from, you know, the Massachusetts coast, somewhere on the New England coast or the Canadian Maritimes, fly for two days and maybe stop in the Dominican Republic for a day or two and then continue on to Venezuela. So this is a shocking trip for a warbler. We know well that um, uh, monarchs make a journey. Uh, let's see, can I get the monarch? Where's the monarch? Uh, let's see, bear with me. Where's our monarch? There it is. We know well that monarchs make a trip, like that's a monarch from going from Essex. They don't have Google map, but they do a fall migration. That's pretty amazing. Here's a dragonfly that also makes a migration. So this thing's called wandering glider. And we see it on the coast and often in late summer and fall. And you can sort of be at marble, let's say you're at Marblehead, like you're birding at Marblehead Neck, or you're somewhere around the coast there. And you see these golden dragonflies flying around. And that, that one I photographed on Monhegan Island, that's ocean behind it. Um, and when we see this dragonfly flying around Marblehead, we might also find it in other places around the world. This is a dragonfly that when it's shown up in Marblehead, it could be in my hometown of Montpelier. It could be in Melbourne, Australia. So this thing has a worldwide distribution. And um, it shows up at different times of the year in those places, but it's basically found on every continent except Antarctica. You know, give it time, it'll be there. Um, so this thing is, this thing is a, this thing is a global citizen, and there are not many organisms that have a distribution like this, except for you know us, some of the stuff that we bring along with us. Um, but it turns out that this thing also shows up in the Maldives, for example, out at sea in the Indian Ocean. They see these things every fall by the millions flying in the Maldives. And it really does turn out that this dragonfly is not, you know, continental, but it is, it is worldwide in its distribution. This thing's like albatross, like an albatross cruising the oceans. And there is no bird, I don't believe, other than maybe house sparrow, passer domesticus, you know, house sparrow that has a distribution like this. Um, and this is one species, by the way. There's not subspecies here. They've done the molecular work on them. This is a panmictic dragonfly. It crosses oceans and turns up anywhere, almost anywhere. And this one came to Montpelier one day. And, you know, like when I see it arriving in Montpelier, like I say to myself, this thing is like, okay, where did you come from? Where did you fly in from? They just show up. Um, it, to me, it's like, this is sort of, like I said, it's like the world, like a world citizen. It's like, 
it's not like only a, an albatross, it's like the Dalai Lama, you know, and it, and it gets around the world under its own power. You know, there, there are other organisms that have worldwide distributions, but they don't cross oceans. Um, and when I see this dragonfly arrive close to home, you know, like my mind starts to wander with it. It sort of arrives and it tells me that there's like this big world out there. I've seen things, I've been places like, um, let's go, let's go see the world together. And even if I never do get out to where this dragonfly has been, it's really nice when some of that world comes to me, when it's um, making a visit to me, bringing some of its stories along with me. So from there, um, oh, let me see, can I clear that? Someone has annotated my screen. I might be able to clear that, I will. So are you all still with me here? I can't see anyone. I hope I'm still here. Yes, we're still yeah, you're here. Oh, you're back. We're here. We're here. We're here. Go. Back to gallery. Okay. Still cool. Here. Don't stop. Don't stop. So Having here's fun. a Sabine's gull. Here's a Sabine's gull that I photographed on a pelagic trip off the Oregon coast. And, you know, that is a great bird, no doubt about it. Um, and these things come through Lake Champlain here in Vermont every September. The, the, there's always a, one of them in mid-September, at least one with all the Bonaparte skulls. Well, there was a day that I was going to go look for them on Lake Champlain. And someone called me up and said, Brian, I've got this moth at my house. Oh, come on. Where's the moth? Where's the moth? Uh, I'm not getting it. My screen is, seems to be locked up. Bear with me, folks. Uh, something happened. Oh, wait, maybe I know. Um, okay. Darn it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Somebody called me up and said, Brian, I got this moth at my house. So I had a choice. Was I going to go see a Sabine skull or go find that moth? I think I know what most of you would do. But you have to remember, you're not going to get a look at a Sabine's gull like this on Lake Champlain. You're, you're looking at this. Like, you're looking at a speck out there. It's like halfway to New York among all the Bonaparte skulls. Um, so you're going to take the scope. You're going to comb through a 1,000 um, Bonaparte skulls and look for that one. It's not even going to be an adult. It's going to be a first cycle Sabine's gull there in September in Vermont. So you say to yourself, well, I still might go for the Sabine skull. Like that moth just isn't really doing it for me. But as it turns out, the woman who called me with the moth did not have that moth as you see it there. She called me with the moth looking like this. This is the caterpillar of that moth. And that moth is called, um, I believe it's called spiny oak slug moth. And I've always wanted to see this thing. <laughs> I've known about it. It's kind of like, I don't know, take your pick. It's like my, it's like your raw skull, you know, like I really wanted to see this thing. And she called me up and said, she's got a caterpillar of that moth. So I went to go, it was in a jar <laughs> and I went to go see it and I photographed it. And um, I chose that instead of the Sabine skull. And I'm really glad I did. Um, and the thing about it is that I photographed the adult of that moth, Euclea delphinia is its scientific name. I photographed it in my backyard. So the adult came to my light on my woodshed and I saw that in my backyard. I have not seen this near my house. I saw it elsewhere. But knowing that that moth is flying around my backyard says to me that this thing is crawling around in a tree near my house. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to look for this thing. I want to find this thing close to home. It's like having a painted bunting in your backyard, you know, uh, at least to me it is. So it won't be that easy finding this moth caterpillar because it's not very big, <laughs> you know, 
but it's a little thing. And I think that's what's really amazing about insects is like little things are there under our noses. We got to go find them. And that is an actual photograph of this caterpillar next to the, an actual dime. That's how tiny it is. Great things, it can be very tiny. So now I want to give you another insect. These are called caddisflies. Some of you may know them. They're ancient insects, somewhat related to moths. They have these sort of like tent-like appearances with these long wiry antennae. And they're kind of cool. But I think what's cooler about caddisflies is that they build these huts when they are larva, when they are immatures, not flying around like that. They build like log cabin shelters or stone shelters to surround themselves as they feed in water. And so they're creepy crawly larvae, not flying around yet. And they're like, you know, they're like stonemasons or carpenters, like building cabins and little stone huts. That is one of the cool things about caddisflies. And um, I was hiking um, once in a pretty amazing place. And in a little creek, I found all these stonemason caddisflies. And that's a picture of them in sitting in the creek. And I found them in a creek while I was backpacking here in the Grand Canyon below the South Rim. Um, and if you're a stonemason, if you're a stonemason dragonfly, there is no better place to find stones than the Grand Canyon. And if you don't believe me that they crawl around in these stone huts, here is one of them. Let's see if this will work. Waltzing around. That's one of the caddis flies. That's one of the caddis flies that I hung out with in the Grand Canyon. And if you know the Grand Canyon, you know that it is nothing if not a history of life on Earth, um, sort of left for us as canyon walls. There's like three dozen layers of rock in this canyon. And the, each rock layer, I've just illustrated just a few of them. Each rock layer represents different events in the Earth's history. And like, here are some of the oldest rock on the lower right here. This is basement rock, this shift, this igneous rock and some metamorphic, um, this metamorphic schist and igneous granite. That's 1.8 billion years old. And then stacked up on top of it, including with some big, big unconformities, big gaps, are like a sandstone layer that represents an ocean side uh, habitat, shale, calm waters, red wall limestone, there's limestone, ocean habitats, uh, Coconino sandstone here, that's a desert that came and went. So like, we have these like major events in the Earth's history, all stacked up in the Grand Canyon. So imagine that happening, leaving layers of rock without a Grand Canyon there, because it wasn't until, so this represents, you know, like 1.8 to 200 billion years to 250 million years of some pretty tumultuous events in the Earth's history stacked for us there. But it wasn't until 6 million years ago, the river decided to cut through it and start to carve the Grand Canyon. And that's the Colorado River. And in this short period of time, relatively short, six million in years, you know, when we were barely Australopithecines, you know, the river opened up this canyon and it wasn't just the river, you know, erosion builds a canyon, not just water, but like wind and storms and ice and rain over six million years opened this place off up and left for us a history of the earth spanning like a billion and a half years like etched like scripture on these canyon walls and erosion widens this place and 
builds a canyon and nothing can put this place back together again. Its pace is relentless. It has been for 6 million years. But then, you know, I thought about like, well, you know, nothing will ever put the Grand Canyon back together again. It's been like a jackhammer going for 6 million years, except maybe for a caddis fly. And, you know, if you look closely at this stonemason, like what you're going to see in there is a speck of granite that's 1.8 billion years old, like a grain of tapete sandstone that's 545 million years old, old, and maybe like a slice of kaibab limestone that's 250 million years old. And in this single stone hut, um, put together by this tiny insect that will live to fly as an adult for only like a week or so is a history gathered together of some of the most tumultuous events in the earth's his, in the earth's past you know like the collision of continents and blasts from volcanoes and the advance of retreats of oceans and deserts and like three mass extinctions like in this one stone hut, this little insect is like building a monument to Earth's history and a monument to the Grand Canyon made of the Grand Canyon. And it's the only thing that can put this place back together again, at least for me. And it's a monument that, you know, I can hold in the palm of my hand as I might sit there and contemplate this place. And so there is an insect that we might never notice you know, doing really wonderful things for us, like putting a little bit of the world back together again. And gosh, if we need the world to come together again, you know, perhaps that's no finer of an example. So I'm going to end up here with one final example of an insect, but it begins when the broad wings fly. So we're in mid September in northern New England and broad wing hawks are migrating. And if you look up, you will see this. But if you look down, you will see this. And if, it's hard, maybe hard for you to see this, but if you look, you see these little tiny discs on the forest floor. These are maple woods near my house. And you can see fallen maple leaves with these holes punched in them. It looks like someone took a hole puncher, like in punched holes in maple leaves. And then these punches, they dump them on the ground. And this story begins actually in June or July when you look at those sugar maple leaves and you start to see some leaf mining insect, something's been eating that maple leaf, okay? And as the summer progresses, the maple leaves will start to look like this. You'll see little discs cut out from the leaf, and then you'll see these little scars where something was eating leaf tissue. And it turns out that doing that to a maple leaf is this, and that is, a little tiny insect that you can barely see. It's shrouded in a little section of maple leaf that has cut out, and it is now cutting out another section of maple leaf. And it's making for itself this like little pita bread. And when it hangs out in that pita bread, it is free to feed on eat leaf tissue, un unbothered by the red-eyed vireos that are in there trying to find caterpillars to eat. So it basically puts itself into a little pita bread and it hides in that pita bread, but it sticks its head off and starts eating leaf tissue. And you can open up the pita bread, and I did that. You open it up and there's the caterpillar, okay? And this is a little caterpillar. It's hard to see, but there are actually, there's one pita bread inside another pita bread. So it, it cut that one and then it outgrew it. There's a, like a clam shell right there. And then there's a bigger clam shell right here. And so it was inside those two pita breads. And so they feed like June, July, August. And then in September, when the broad wings fly, they make a migration that isn't nearly as far as broad wings. They go down to the ground. And for a while, I was thinking that they might crawl down the trunk. They might like a turtle, like lug their pita bread shelter and go to earth with them. But actually what happens is they, they fall. And you can see them here at the base of this maple. They just, the wind blows and these little pita breads with this little caterpillar in it fall to earth. And 
by the way, making these pita breads is an insect called Paraclemencia acerifoliella. And I won't tell you its common name yet, but it is a caterpillar that is kind of smart, you know? It basically, um, you know, decides to build a little shelter while it's feeding on a leaf so a songbird can't eat it. I have seen chick chickadees take these apart and get at the caterpillar in there. But for the most part, it's going about its business. There are a lot of them, you know, and it's, it's eating and growing and eating and growing. And then in the fall, when the broad wings go, they drop to earth. And so there was something that intrigued me. I've been watching these things for like 20 years, you know. And one thing intrigued me about them last summer, like I, I actually asked myself, after it builds its pita bread, what it does is it flips itself over so that the big slice of the pita, the bigger half, is covering it entirely so it can reach out and feed on leaf tissue. And so there you see it there. So I actually was wondering, I, just for, for whatever reason, last uh, in 2019, actually, not last year, in 2019, I said to myself, well, what if I flipped it over? Like, what if I disturbed it? Would it be able to right itself in the place, the position that it wanted to be? So let's find out. Let's find out. So here I am flipping it over, wondering whether it'll be able to turn itself back in the position that it likes. There you have it. And I have to tell you, that summer and, you know, last summer um, during the pandemic, I actually had just wonderful times, you know, sort of harassing these little caterpillars and turning them over. And they would invariably turn themselves over within a minute or two, turn themselves back over. And this is, a, this is an insect that I've been watching for 20 years and never really even considered whether it would do that. So now, you know, when the broad wings fly, and um you know they're making this spectacular migration from northern forests into central america and toward into south america this really really spectacular flight it really really impressive i actually can go to my, go in my yard and i can watch a caterpillar make a very short migration a matter of feet from the leaf of a sugar maple to the forest floor and it will spend the winter there in its little pita bread and um, it will pupate. There will be a, the, the caterpillar will form a cocoon in that pita bread. <laughs> I don't know what you, the technical term for that thing is, that shelter, that leaf tissue shelter. And then in June, what will emerge is this little tiny moth and this one came to my light. It's a terrible picture. I got to get better pictures. And this is Paraclemencia acerifoliella. It's called maple leaf cutter moth. And I had them at my light and it migrated from, you know, the leaf of a maple to the forest floor and then to my light for a visit one, uh, one night, many nights in June. And these things fly around. They'll be flying around in June this year. They, they had a really good year, those caterpillars last year. So, you know, to wrap up, you know, um, this nexus of birds and birding and insects, um, insects for birders, well, um, you know, many of us like to keep 
life lists. But I think with insects, yeah, you can keep lists. You can keep lists of insects that you that you see. But I I consider them not just things to list or you know beautiful and ornate and diverse things to see, but like I think that these are more than anything experiences. And I think that when it comes to the ways that we like to experience nature, like in all of its diversity and beauty and brutality and um, and in, in sort of evolutionary history, like you've got a little caterpillar that flips over its shelter like a like a expert turtle. You've got a dragonfly that flies around the world. You've got a uh, a caddisfly that puts some of that world back together again. And then you've got this shock, shock and awe moth caterpillar. So there are four experiences for you. And with a million insects, you know, you've got um, a long way to go on your life list and lots of things uh, to see and experience. So I hope I've convinced you to do so. And we can end it there. And I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. I will um, also just remind you that at the um, at the club's website by Monday, I will have a link to some of the resources that I didn't talk about tonight so that you can sort of pursue this uh, with help from others or on your own. So let me see here. I have stopped Ryan. sharing. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I kept us much too long. No, no, it was incredibly rich and um, I'm inspired uh, to go out first thing in the morning and start looking for what insects are here now. So, uh, um, and there was lots of activity on the chat, um, people sharing notes of attracting insects, what's, what works, what doesn't, or what works better. And I, and I think one thing that would be helpful, especially where you were noting about catching insects to observe them better and to take photographs is what is a safe way if you're gonna catch a butterfly, catch a moth, um, where you don't wanna be damaging the scales on them. Uh, just a little tip there I think would be helpful. Yeah, um, for dragonflies, you know, these are durable insects. They've been around for like more than 300 million years. You can actually, it, it, it requires some learning and that's why it's great to do it with someone. You can actually kind of fold their wings together and take them out by the wings. You saw some of the people holding them. And basically you pull a dragonfly out of the net, you look at it, you ID it. And sometimes we need to have them in the hand to ID them with certainty. You just let them go and they fly away. Um, butterflies, moths are tough, you know. Lots of people will, like we used to do as kids with fireflies, you know, catch them in the net, put them in a jar. Um, or just for moths, you don't need a net. You turn your light on at night, they will come to you. You know, warblers don't do that. Um, butterflies, there is a really great technique that I, that I teach in my classes that allows you to use flat tipped forceps like stamp tongs to safely pull them out, look at them, learn about them, photograph them, document them for some of this data sharing, and then let them go. Or let put them in a little jar, observe them and let them go. Um, you know, this isn't for everybody, but you know, if you wanna be serious about it and you wanna learn them, I'm, I'm a net advocate and not everyone is, I'll acknowledge that, but you have the opportunity to enjoy these, these insects really on, on any terms that you like. They're that accessible and they're that evident. And there was um, kind of connected to that, there was a question about are a lot of the photographs that you took ones where you had first caught the insect and then set them up or um, is it kind of, what's the percentage of maybe the images we were looking at that involved pre-catching them versus just um, capturing them um, as they were? Or, yeah. Uh, more than all, basically all of them, there was only one insect in there that was posed and it was that big red dragonfly. All of those were field photographed, not caught insects and not posed. So, you know, I love doing that as much as I love birding. You know, it's, it's, I love 
following them and being with them and learning about how they are out there so that I can capture them with a camera. In fact, the vast, basically, all of, virtually all of the insects you saw there were never netted. Virtually all of them were photographed in the wild as they posed for me. Well, that's great to know. Um, thanks for that. And uh, certainly want to see if there's people that there, there were more questions that came in on the chat, but if there's people that want to ask questions in person, that's one of the, the advantages of having this as a meeting as opposed to a webinar. So um, does someone want to jump in? I'm game. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a question. I, I found out about this on the PEM. I'm a PEM member. And I saw this and I was like, oh, that's really cool. Oh, that's tonight. Oh, we are just so, so that's why I'm here. So this is really cool. I have tons of birds in my yard and insects and such. I live in Lynn. And when we moved to Lynn, the two owners before us grew these really great, huge verbena bunches, lemon verbena. And I discovered praying mantis a lot. And I was fascinated by them. I took video, I took, like I documented so many praying mantis and the activity and the mating and and they're really fascinating because in the daytime their eyes are green, but when it gets dusk and dark, their eyes turn red. Super cool. Mm -hmm. um, I no longer have lemon verbena. I'm getting to my question. No longer lemon verbena. I want to get like mantis nests to grow, but I also want to get like kind of mature verbena plants so they'll have something to grasp onto. Do you know of any other plants that praying mantis might thrive on? I'm afraid that I don't. Um, um, our praying mantis species, the one we tend to see most often is not a native mantis actually, oh. but um, I don't, I wish I could answer that, but I'm They're afraid They're so I fascinating. There's, I just love them yeah, so I don't much. Think it's, I think it's association with the verbena is incidental. That's a great butterfly nectar plant, verbena yeah. bonaerensis in particular. So um, many bees and hornets and all sorts of like yeah. damselflies and dragonflies, awesome, so cool. Yeah. But thank you. This is this is a, so amazing. Sorry. Yeah. Loved it. No, that's okay. Figures I asked the question. <laughs> no, it's great. Brian, you talked a lot about um, the diversity and the multiplicity of insects. And we're also reading an awful lot about their rapid diminishment, just as we've read about the enormous number of birds that are diminishing and there's certainly a relationship there. Can you talk a little bit about the threats and also the important strategies of conservation toward insects that, um, that we can participate in or that are going on? Yeah, this is a really good question, Dudley, and I will try not to go on too long about it, but um, yes, in the ways that we know that bird diversity, particularly certain suites of birds, grassland species, aerial insectivores are declining. Particular suites of insects are declining. Um, and it's not only insect biodiversity, but it's insect abundance. And there's a lot, there are studies, many of them are in Europe, that is showing a shocking drop in insect diversity. It's been somewhat simplified in the mass media. You hear about the insect Armageddon, there are places where it's happening worse than others. You know, I can tell you that, um, you know, if, if insects are part of the sixth uh, uh, extinction, you know, they will outlive us in this extinction. You know, they've been at this game for 400 million years and they're gonna be here after we're gone. In terms of getting at that problem, the effort to fix you know, to remedy insect decline is going to require an effort that's on a par with the effort to remedy climate change. Mm -hmm. It's that simple and it's that difficulty. You know, yeah. we are a species that has been powerful enough to warm a planet and incapable of doing anything about it. And a lot of insect decline is due to the way we eat food. It's the way that agriculture has grown on this planet. 
And so some of the proximate causes for, our, for insect decline is agriculture. Yes, there is pesticides to be blamed and habitat loss and light pollution, but um, in, you know, and it varies in temperate uh, climates, the proximate causes are different than they are in, in tropical climates, for example. So it's not, there's no easy answer, but the solution is really something that's gonna require big changes in the way that we go about our business on the planet. You know, yes, you can create habitat in your own backyard, um, but the problem is so much bigger than that. Not to, that not to, you know, know, not to, you know, I'm privileged to be here tonight when there's so much trouble going on in the world and some really disturbing news today. News today, and it's so nice to be able to talk about this stuff with you. Um, but you know, yeah, I'm glad you asked about insect decline because it's a, it's something that's not going to be easily be fixed. No, and I think it it requires all of us both to um, to talk about it and to to pressure for it in the same way that you do for climate change, but also to literally start in your backyard and think about yeah. what you can plant, what you can not grow, um, where you can, heaven help us if you're poisoning things, stop doing that. Thanks. And I guess that's another um, vital reason for planting native plants, right, Brian, Absolutely. is that the, yeah. that the insects, you know, we can put things like ginkgos in our yard, but it's not really supporting the, the insect population if we do that. Yeah, right. and you know, if you're a birder, if you want birds in your yard, and you're, let's say you're not feeding over the summer, if you want birds in your yard, you need to grow insects. That's a generalization, but like insects are primary converters, like Birds don't eat oak leaves. Insects eat oak, le oak leaves and birds eat insects. And if you want to increase the bird diversity in your yard, make it a good place for insects. And I'll point out that an oak, for example, will host far greater insect diversity than a maple. So you can be strategic about this. So like you want birds, grow insects in your yard. <laughs> Well, I think that's probably a good place for us to, to wrap up where it's bringing back the birds with the insects. Um, and uh, Brian, thanks for making the offer to put together some resources that we can access. I know there will be interest in that. Um, and such a pleasure to finally be able to have you here with us. I know we've been wanting to have you join us for quite a while. and. This seemed like a great way to do it because so many more people were able to take part than we could have even accommodated um, at the PEM. So such a such a great evening, so much richness in, in what you shared with us and so wonderful to have so many people from so far and near uh, take part in this. Um, be well and uh, and we will look forward to having you join us again, Brian, on another topic, hopefully. And, and we hope we see many of you again at, uh, in the fall when we'll be joining in lectures. And in the meantime, do take part in the, the walks that are coming up or in the uh, annual canoe trip. Take care, everyone. <laughs>